Welcome to Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, where we ask some of the best teachers we know questions from you, our audience. If you have a question or an idea for a conversation, please visit bit.ly backslash Ask Psych Sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash Ask Psych Sessions. All one word, all lowercase. And here's our next question. Thank you for joining us today. I have two guests with us, Dr. Eleni Pino from University of Wisconsin Superior and Dr. Amy Hunter, my colleague at Seton Hall University. Before we jump into our topic today, which is project syllabus, it would be great if both of you could uh, tell the listeners a little bit about your research and teaching background. What's it like at your institution? What do you teach? That sort of thing. A little context, please. And I'll ask you to begin, Eleni. Sure. So, um, Thanks for the introduction. My name is Eleni Pino. I went to graduate school briefly with Mary Ann. So I have a PhD in cognitive psychology from Binghamton University. I'm a spoken uh, word recognition kind of person. So real low level speech stuff. Um, although I am currently at a teaching institution. So I'm at the University of Wisconsin Superior, which is the smallest school in um, the UW system. So we have about 2,000 undergraduates and then maybe 500 graduate students, although I don't personally have any graduate students. Um, So it's a teaching heavy institution. Um, I teach a 4-4 and basically the way that my load works now is I teach classes on campus and then I teach those same classes online at the same time. So our program just recently started the online major that went live in the fall of 2020, I believe. So that um, has been kind of a big shift in what I actually teach. So uh, traditionally throughout my career, I've been here, I think 13 years, I've taught everything from um, introduction to psychology to capstone senior research, uh, which is our capstone research-based project. Now I mostly teach reading and writing for psychology, which is a class that there's a syllabus for on project syllabus. And um, I teach the capstone course. Uh, I've taught development and I also teach a learning and behavior class, psychopharmacology and psycholinguistics pretty regularly. In the past, I have taught behavioral neuroscience of which I also have a syllabus on project syllabus for. And um, our institution is, is small, like I mentioned. So most of my classes, my online classes are capped at 25 and those typically fill to capacity. And my on-campus classes will range from um, our senior capstones having maybe 15 people in it to our biggest class, which is intro. Um, and I laugh when I say it's our biggest class, but that's usually capped at 35. <laughs> A superior class size. It is a superior class size. Thank you, Eleni. Uh, Amy, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Sure. So my background is in behavioral neuroscience. I got my degree at the University of Vermont. Um, in grad school, I mostly studied uh, neural mechanisms of learning and memory. And then when I started my own lab, I shifted that a little bit to study the influence of sleep, and in particular REM sleep, on uh, how, how that affects learning and memory. So because of that, probably the uh, perennial course in my rotation is biological psychology, which is maybe the, my favorite part of my job is getting to teach biological psychology on a regular basis. Um, other fun things, I get to teach research methods a lot, which I find more fun than my students, I think. Uh, I've also was able to create our one credit orientation to the major class. And so I get to teach that every now and then. Um, I have taught, let's see, I've taught a lot of things, but now I'm blanking on all of them. Um, graduate level psychopharmacology class. I taught motivation and emotion a while back. I have a one credit biological psychology lab course. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff really from first year students all the way to graduate students. And so that's been a really interesting thing to be able to do, uh, to be able to teach students across all of those levels. Um, as Marianne said, I'm at Seton Hall. We're colleagues at Seton Hall. Um, I'm sure there's another part of that question I was supposed to answer, and now I've already forgotten what that is. I think you're covered. Yes, and I I think that they've heard from uh, Dr. Nolan on the big podcast a few times too. So they may know everyone they already know about Seton Hall. Probably they probably know more than I do. (laughs) Well, thank you both. Um, We'll transition now into this idea of project syllabus, which uh, Eleni is the current director and Amy is the immediate past director. Uh, The transition I think happened in early 2022. And it occurred to me that 
probably some people don't know about Project Syllabus, and it's for a teaching podcast, something that could be very helpful. So, um, Eleni, can you maybe give a short version of what is Project Syllabus? Where would I find it? And what would I do when I got there? Sure. So Project Syllabus is an online repository of peer-reviewed syllabi that have been peer-reviewed to kind of make sure that they meet these best practices and high quality, high student learning impact metrics that we have. So we have a rubric um, that was based, that's an evidence-based research um, rubric, and you send in your syllabus, we evaluate it, well, I send it out to reviewers, um, and then they evaluate it based on this rubric. And then you might be asked to make changes like you would in a, like if you were submitting to a journal. So it's kind of like an online journal, basically, of syllabi is another way to kind of think about it. But everything is peer reviewed. Great. And Amy, this is part of Society for Teaching and Psych, right? So is it on that website? Like, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of navigating and finding things? Because if I recall, this is the trouble with your colleague interviewing you. Um, there was even some rubric shifting. You did the, this work, it feels like, for many years. Um, so maybe if you just want to give like a quick history of what's up there and, and the rubric, that'd be great. Sure, absolutely. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember the year that I took over, but I did it for, I think, four years, five years, maybe. I was the director of Project Syllabus. And one of the one of the initiatives that um, I started was to overhaul the rubric. When I started out, it was much more subjective approach, sort of a you know it when you see it kind of thing in terms of good teaching. But one of the things that I spearheaded was an overhaul of the rubric. So now, as Eleni said, it's based on best practices, on evidence-based best practices. So it's based on literature that exists out in the field demonstrating that we know improves things like improves student metrics. So improves student motivation, student outcomes, things like that. Um, so that was one of the things that we had changed um, to make also makes, I think, for a more reliable scoring mechanism when our reviewers look at it to have this rubric, it does make for more reliable data, which we like re reliability. Um, it is, yes, as Marianne said, it is sponsored by Society for Teaching of Psychology. Um, I wish I could remember the webpage, but I don't. The way that I always find it, you think that I have it bookmarked. I do not. I just go Google Project Syllabus STP and magically it shows up. Um, so uh, I'm sure, however, that we could, that, that Marianne and all of her podcast wizardry could drop a link into the podcast notes. I'll gladly yeah. put a link in the show notes. Well, can we maybe just take a minute or two and talk about um, good syllabi, quality syllabi that do things like improve motivation? I don't know how your semesters went. Well, I mean, I kind of do know how your semester went, but um, motivation definitely felt like it could have used some uh, injection in the positive direction. So could you talk a little bit about what, what do quality syllabi do um, versus not? And again, because I know you, I, I know that you also have some kind of research interests here. So I'll assume this is highly fluent for you if you want to go first. And then Eleni, if you want to add anything as the new person looking at new syllabi, that'd be great. Sure. So the, a lot of the project syllabus rubric and then also my own work, um, not only a line of research like you alluded to, but also just personally in terms of creating syllabi is really informed by some work that Aaron Richmond has done over the years with some colleagues of his in terms of changing, in particular, the tone of the syllabus. And so I think that's something that is actually a real, uh, feels like low-hanging fruit in terms of things that we can change that is pretty easy to do in terms of our syllabi. Um, but thinking about the tone of the syllabus and shifting it from a more teacher-centered perspective, what is convenient for us, to a more learner-centered perspective of this course is designed to help you do the following things, um, things along those lines. So I think that changing, thinking about the tone of the syllabus, which has been shown to improve things like student motivation and commitment and all of these good things, uh, I think is one of the um, easier things to implement as part of one syllabus. Being explicit about grading is also something that is heavily emphasized in or student assessment in general, but being explicit about student assessment is very heavily emphasized in the rubric, which is something I've also taken to trying to modify my syllabi to be consistent with the project syllabus rubric was one of the outcomes of becoming the director of project syllabus as I suddenly looked at my syllabi and said, oh my, I guess there are some things I should change if I'm the director of this. Uh, and certainly my syllabi have changed a lot over the years to be more consistent with that project syllabus rubric. But I think those are some of the easier things, just changing the tone to be more 
a student centered and also being a lot more explicit about the course, about why I designed it the way that I did, how student work is assessed, um, tie, really being explicit about tying learning objectives to assessment, things along those lines. Um, I think those have all been really helpful and have changed a lot about the way that I design my own courses. And I think they're just take homes for, for anyone. If you were just to go look at the rubric, you could figure out there's a lot of ways I think that folks can apply that rubric to their own syllabi without even necessarily not, we would love you to submit something to Project Syllabus, but even if you choose not to, I think just looking at the rubric, there's a lot of take homes and a lot of things that you might be able to change for your own syllabus. Great. Thank you. Eleni, what would you like to toss in there? So I would echo everything that Amy said. Um, I think that the tone one is really important. And um, that's one of the things that reviewers often ask people to change or to modify, because I think that for a lot of faculty, we tend to think of our syllabi as like contracts, like legalistic type documents that are something that we give to students and tell them what they need to do. Um, instead of thinking about syllabi as kind of the first step in relationship building in the semester. And so I think a lot of that tone and like the warmth that we look for is really tied to that beginning to relationship build while also laying out expectations. One thing that I also really like is there's a symmetry to thinking about what's expected. So we have a section in the rubric that's about um, the faculty roles and responsibilities and the student roles and responsibilities. So um, I tell my students what I what they can expect from me, grading turnaround time, like email responsiveness, all of that kind of fun stuff that I'm like kind of promising that I will do to them. And then I'm telling them what they will do for for the class in return. So I think that that also helps so that it doesn't seem like it's so one-sided from that relationship building piece as well. But like, I'm someone that you can rely on. Here's the contract that I'm willing to make with you. Um, the learning outcomes are really helpful. And I think my institution is gearing up for a fun um, higher learning commission accreditation visit, which is our regional accreditor. And that's something that they really want to see in syllabus is mapping those university and program learning outcomes to the actual assignments. So I think, you know, not to talk about how great STP is, but I think, you know, division two STP really anticipates a lot of the stuff that's coming up. Um, in terms of what accreditors are going to be asking for. So I think that that's incredibly helpful. Um, there's also some nice sections in there about universal design. So um, I think that that is also really helpful as we think about how can we make psychology more accessible and that kind of stuff. So those, I think, are the really big criteria, you know, just having clear organizations. Sometimes, you know, when I look back at my syllabi before, I became, you know, evangelized and into project syllabus. A lot of them were really focused on, um, you know, like saying the same thing multiple places or having like poor organization, but it really is just made for a much tighter syllabus. Sometimes um, the one thing that can be kind of annoying, I think for submitters is like, there are things that you might be required to put in your syllabus that don't always work with the best practices by your university. We have several of those. And, you know, that's something that you can just make a note to reviewers about as well. And we can kind of deal with that. Okay, great. So let's maybe transition into, um, I think I might have good syllabus. I should just call you, Eleni, and tell you all about it. If you call me, you will get a message on my voicemail. It's like, do not leave a voicemail. Under no circumstances should you leave a voicemail. So um, what you should probably do instead is if you go to the STP website, um, it'll tell you how to do it. But you can email me at syllabus at teachpsych.org. Um, and that will uh, send me the syllabi that you have, oops, the syllabus that you want to submit to review. So, I mean, you certainly can email me. Um, you know, I'm a public employee, so it's very easy to find my actual email address. Um, and I, you know, it all goes to the same email inbox, I guess is what I would say. But yeah, so syllabus at teachpsych.org is how you can submit your awesome syllabus for review. And then if I think that I'm really great at noticing other people's greatness, it sounds like, Eleni, you moved up from being a reviewer um, with Amy to taking over the crown. That means that that's at least one person missing. <laughs> Do you take other volunteers that want to review? Yes. So we've had um, some retirements and some people that are 
changed institutions and didn't update with us. So we've had a little bit of a reviewer shortage. And also, as you can imagine, faculty are just, it's very hard to find reviewers during the middle of the semester too. So um, if you feel like this is something that, you know, you're really good at following rubrics and you're really detail oriented, um, please also send a Vita that you have to the um, syllabus at teachsych.org and we will, uh, and, and I'll, look at those. And then in early June, I'll have a training document kind of like breaking down the rubric, doing some explanation for how that works. So yeah, yeah, we, we would love to have it. And the other thing that I think is really helpful is like, you know, having been out of the research game for so long, being at a primarily teaching institution, I feel like there's not a lot that I can give back to the profession in terms of like reviewing scholarly articles, because my brain is sometimes toast and I can't quite like feel like I'm up to date enough on my literature to do like an informed literature, like type of, you know, reviewer thing. So this is really great for people who view SOTL as their primary research activity to feel like they are contributing and giving back to the field. And also it's a great place to get, you know, peer reviewed stuff done as well. So for, you know, my tenure and promotion process, my syllabi that were peer reviewed for project syllabus counted. Great. I'm sold. Um, <laughs> hopefully some listeners are also sold. Yes. So this is, you know, I just want to reiterate that this is a great uh, both resource and opportunity. So I'm very thankful that both of you were willing to come in and, and talk a bit um, more about what it is. And, and hopefully some curious listeners will reach out either with their syllabi or as potential reviewers or both, right? And I imagine you can have it all. Um, but I usually also like to let my uh, guests, if there's anything we didn't get to touch on that they, we wanted, they wanted to talk about today, whether it's project syllabus or project syllabus adjacent or I suppose with the editing power, I can let you talk about whatever you want. Um, so is there anything that we didn't get to that you were hoping that we could um, add on? And I'll let you start, Amy. Sure. So I think even if you're not interested or, or might not be ready to, to commit to submitting something to your project syllabus, I just think that rubric is such a great place to start as a way to think about what your courses look like and think about, like I said, there's some minor changes you could make that can potentially, that, that take almost no time on the faculty member's part and could potentially have a really big impact on your students. And again, I keep coming back to tone because I feel like that is really low hanging fruit, but I also think that that's something that in my syllabi is something that has changed so dramatically in the past few years. And there's a lot of you know reasons for that, but certainly when I first started teaching, um, being young, back then and being female, I think I was very concerned. I really wanted to make sure that my syllabi were serious because I wanted to make sure I wasn't being taken advantage of and I wanted the rules written down. I was very serious about this. And that really contrasted with the, the legitimate enthusiasm that I have for my field. And, and after the fact, I've had more than one student over the years say, when I saw your syllabus, I was really, really scared. And then when I got to class, it was amazing. And, and at some point I realized there was this just disconnect between who someone thought I was if they just looked at my syllabus and who I, I am actually in person in the classroom. And I think that working with the project syllabus rubric really helped me to refine that and helped me to really think deliberately about what my syllabus looked like. And to remember, this is the first point of communication that students have with you. What do you want students to know about you? What do you want them to understand about you? Literally before they even walk into the classroom. The cynics among us will say, oh, they don't look at it, who reads it, whatever. And I get that. That's partly true. But from my perspective, even if it's, I don't know, 10%, 5% of my students who are looking at my syllabus on the LMS before the first day, those are the students I, I certainly, I mean, I care about them all. But really, those are the students I care about, right? They are interested enough in my class that they want to know something about it and me before the semester even starts. And I'm willing to take that time to make the syllabus a more accurate representation of who I am well, and who, who my ideal self is, I should say, and then what I want that to actually look like and what I want them to, to know about me in the class before we even walk in the door. And again, some of it is so simple. Um, I think most places uh, we are, are required or strongly encouraged to have a statement about students with disabilities. And so for years, I just copied and pasted that off our university's website and then Again, embarrassingly recently, I realized this. I'm like, wow, the tone of that is very, it's legalistic, it's harsh. And so I recently just started that with a sentence that said something like, 
I am happy to work with you to help you implement any accommodations you might have. Please reach out to me. And then the rest of it is all the legalese. So I didn't change anything. I'm not doing anything wrong, but I start with a more welcoming statement. And I'm willing to bet that anybody who's taking the time to listen to this podcast also actually has that has that um, inclination in terms of working with students. So I think that looking at the rubric, even if you don't want to go through, it's I was gonna say rigmarole. It's not really rigmarole. Just admit it's great. It's easy. It's I promise. Um, but even if you feel like you're not there yet, I think starting with the rubric just as ways to change your syllabus, change your course would be good. And then the second thing that I I like to point out is um, how many good ideas I've gotten from reading through other people's syllabi. And I have to say, so um, Eleni syllabus in particular for biological psychology, I need to go reread because what I'd like to do is take some of her ideas for the biological psychology lab that I'm revamping over the summer. But even for a class you've taught, who knows how many times, people have some really interesting and different approaches to things. And it's a great way, a great place to get ideas. I would also imagine that anybody who's got a syllabus posted, especially in the past couple of years, if you have questions, people tend to be you know, responsive to, to emails if you want to chat further about about teaching. Um, and most people have their, con- if it's a good syllabus, they should have their contact info on the syllabus. So I imagine that people, again, anybody I think who takes the time to submit this is likely interested in engaging and in having a conversation on, on teaching and especially on how they teach their classes. Great. Thank you. Those were terrific points. Yes, Melody. that's like an awesome, like, philosophical overview and like justification for project syllabus. So um, the, I don't have a ton to add with that. Um, I would just say as an instructor, um, cause I think uh, that's how I, well, first I came across project syllabus because Marianne reached out to me and said that um, I should consider reviewing. And I was like, sweet, I'll do it. Um, this sounds awesome. And then, you know, it became clear to me that this is like a really, awesome repository so I don't have to reinvent the wheel all of the time. Um, So I feel like faculty turnover, at least at my institution, is higher than maybe it was when I first started. So oftentimes, you know, like you'll have fun new surprise classes that you didn't know you were going to have to prep. Um, So in this past fall, I I was assigned um, child and adolescent development two weeks before the semester started and I never taught it before. And so project syllabus was a really invaluable thing to kind of go through and, you know, both look for ideas about assignments, but also to just kind of like reassure me that, you know, this isn't an impossible task. So I think that that's really helpful. And I wish that I had been more aware of project syllabus when I was starting, you know, in 2009, because I made those same kind of legalistic, I have to be taken seriously um, kind of approaches. And it's it's just so different. It's so much more freeing to be, I guess, mid-career. And so I think that project syllabus can be really helpful for that. And I think it would help ease a lot of angst of developing those syllabi for people who are, you know, transitioning into full-time faculty or um, a- academic instructional staff kind of stuff. So I love it for that. And the other thing that um, we've mostly talked about undergraduate classes, but we do have a section of graduate syllabi on project syllabus. And we have two more that should probably be published in the next month or two of graduate syllabi. So that's really exciting. Um, really, it is for all levels of teaching. So if you're like, what are these undergrad people know? Well, I might not know much about graduate teaching, but we have some syllabi that know about it. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. And that's a good, I'm making a mental note. We have a new colleague coming on for the fall. Perhaps they already know about project syllabus, perhaps not. So that's good, a uh, good reminder that, um, to send that along. Well, thank you both so much for your time and perspective. And I hope our listeners will check out project syllabus. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes. I've been talking today with Dr. Eleni Pino from University of Wisconsin-Superior and Dr. Amy Hunter from Seton Hall University. Mm-hmm.